Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and very good afternoon to audience. Okay, my name is Dr. Fauzi. I'm an analytical chemist in spectroscopy and chromatography. First of all, I would like to say many thanks to Dr. Sharif Fazli Muhammad Zambri as a host from Faculty of Applied Sciences, as a host and for setting up these webinar sessions. Okay. Today, so we, we, here, we are here today for a presentation from a well-known professor, figure in UITM, University Technology Mara. She's a professor, Dr. Bahar, Hadariah Bahrun. Professor Dr. Hadiah Bahrun is an expert in coordination chemistry. She earned her PhD in 1994 in the field of coordination chemistry at the University of Surrey, United Kingdom. As a young lecture scheme scholar or holder of UITM, that time is ITM, she returned to serve ITM in 1995 as a chemistry lecturer. In brief, she has contributed a lot in teaching and learning as for diploma and degree program, as well as, a, as, well as in curriculum development for UITM. Besides lecturing, similarly actively supervising postgraduate students since year 2000 along with graduating numerous PhD and master's students in the Coordination Chemistry Research Group of FSG UITM. In addition, she has been appointed 21 times as external examiner for PhD and master's students of some university in Malaysia, as well as being an internal examiner for UITM postgraduate students. Prof. Hada managed to secure various research grants such as eScience, FRGS, Base Diary, SIFI, and, and as well as a contract research grant from industry. Okay? She is an entity of the Indonesian World Class Professor Program at UNNES in 2017. She was the, she was at the Office of Academic Affairs of UITM yeah, since 2006 to 2014, almost eight years. Yeah, then put in charge for research and innovation. Okay, Penolong Nak Chancellor in PNI, Penolong Nak Chancellor in Research and Innovation of UITM for five years since 2014 to 2019. Prof. Hadai just, has just completed her nine months sabbatical leave in University of Malaya in, 2000, in June 2020. Okay, Prof. Hada also has written widely in field of coordination chemistry at the National International Cooperator in Index and High Impact Journal, as well as our homegrown journal in UITM. Her passion in academic writing developed early when she wrote a few textbook for Malaysian schools and UITM academic program for colleagues inside and outside UITM. Okay. Prof. Hada, okay, today, Prof. Hada would like to share her experience in evaluating PhD and master's thesis with the young academics inside and outside UITM. Definitely, current postgraduate student would benefit tremendously from this sharing session. Please welcome Prof. Hada. Well, <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Fauzi. That's too much. Um, <laughs> Well, I was just, I'm, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do as a lecturer and um, over the period of uh, more than 25 years, um, I have obviously accumulated some experience, some uh, enrichment in, in, my, in my knowledge as well. So today, 
<clears throat> allow me please to present my slides. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I would like to first uh, thank uh, the Faculty of Applied Sciences, uh, Faculty Science Gunaan at UITM uh, Shah Alam for giving me a slot to do a sharing session. Um, first of all, first it was only uh, to be shared among friends in Faculty of Applied Sciences, but since the topic that I have chosen is uh, applicable to many uh, people inside and outside of Faculty of Applied Sciences, inside of us and outside of UITM, um, Yes, everybody's welcome to to listen to my little sharing uh, session. So the topic of my presentation today is effective postgraduate examination, thesis evaluation and viva voce. It is a guide for young academics and postgraduates. Uh, when People say evaluate a thesis, do viva voce, many young academics. When I was young, I, I did not know much about this. I learned through experience. We, we learn as we go along. But today, I think uh, that is why I, I think I would like to share with um, our younger colleagues uh, on who is doing what and how that is done. So <clears throat> some of you may have been invited to um to become internal examiner or external examiner for postgraduate thesis or even for final year project student or a thesis so if you have been invited to do that congratulations to you because it is a significant milestone for an academic yeah the question is do you accept the invitation or do you decline? So there are a few things that you need to consider when you are considering uh, to accept or to decline. So my advice is you accept only if you are in the field. Sometimes uh, when people read your CV and they, they see that you are doing a lot of work in a certain field, um, they invite you. But maybe uh, it's not truly your field of interest. Uh, so if you're not in the field, uh, don't accept it. But if you are in the field, by all means, accept it. And number two, you, you only accept it if you are sure that you can dedicate the time. Because to read a thesis requires time and commitment. So you must have time to read and to evaluate that thesis. Otherwise, do not accept. If you are uh, very, very busy with other commitments, for example, for that month, do not accept. Otherwise, you will be um, being unfair to the candidate. And number three, you only accept if you are feeling neutral about the student um, uh, or the supervisor. If you have strong feelings towards him or her, I advise that you do not accept it. And number four, it is very important. You only accept that invitation if you are willing to learn because you are bound to be learning as well, not only evaluating, but learning as well. So the flip side of that is you decline if you are not even vaguely in the area of that thesis. Be fair, decline it if you, if you are not able to do a, uh, a good evaluation. Number two, if you are busy, you can't meet the deadline, please decline the invitation, just to be fair to everyone. Number three, decline also if you have strong feelings, especially negative, if you have had some experience with the candidate or, or with the supervisor, this may happen. Uh, so do not accept that invitation for fear that you will be uh, um, biased uh, to 
to not be able to look objectively at the thesis. And um, <clears throat> uh, when also decline if you're not open to new knowledge, yeah? Always in the framework of learning and learning and learning, lifelong learning. And one thing is don't accept the invitation to become external or internal examiner if you just want to flaunt your superiority and knowledge. If you think, yeah, I know this field. I want to tell them I, I, I'm, I'm able to do this. I, 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 can, I can give good uh, input to this. Or if you just want to flaunt it, then don't accept it. You just you it is a learning experience. It is a knowledge sharing process. So uh, come in with a, a good frame of mind when you are uh, invited to be an examiner. So that is the first thing that you must think. So I always I always consider these things before I say yes or no to uh, that invitation of becoming internal or external examiner. So next, uh, gosh, it's not it's not doing it, is it? How do I how do I get this to move? Oh, I can do it, do it like that. Okay. Uh, the course outcome today's talk. What will you gain today? Inshallah, at the end of this course, you ought to be able to outline important criteria in assessing a thesis. You ought to be able to evaluate a PhD or a master thesis competently and fairly, and you ought to be able to write thesis evaluation report for by Bavose. So that's what those are the things, the area that I'm going to cover. So first of all, what is a thesis? Yeah, a thesis actually is a statement that somebody wants to discuss or prove. It is a document submitted in support of the candidature of an academic degree for professional qualification presenting the author's research and findings. It is commonly it commonly contains but not limited to the following parts. Usually you will see roughly five chapters. Chapter one would be the introduction. <clears throat> Chapter two would be literature review. Chapter three would be methodology, chapter four results and discussion, and chapter five conclusion. But this is not the, uh, the compulsory practice for all. You may find theses that do not follow this structure and they also are quite valid. Now, thesis, I'm sure some of you have, read, uh, have written or have read a thesis you will find that some of the theses are very delightful, delightful, but some are very frightful, makes you, makes you despair. So for part one of my talk, I'm going to talk about the thesis, yeah? A delightful thesis shows the following characteristics. So if any of my audience today is a student doing the uh, postgraduate stu uh, studies, be aware of how to produce a delightful thesis. So a delightful thesis has these characteristics. It excites the readers, evaluators. It makes them feel, wow, this is very good. Yeah, You ought to be able to excite your readers. Number two, it has high quality of language use. If it's written in English, it has to be high quality of English use. If it is written in Malay, it has to be of good, beautiful, high quality of Malay language, if it's written in any language at all. And number three, it contains minimal spelling and sentence error, because these things, even though they are small, they will, def they will um, take away the pleasure of reading that thesis. So when, when your evaluators do not find pleasure in reading your thesis, then that's going to be dangerous. Uh, number four, it has coherent presentation that flows smoothly from one chapter to another. You will feel that, ah, this is a good story. Oh, the readers will feel like, yes, I can follow this. This is beautifully presented. Number five, it contains substantial and comprehensive coverage. Not uh, superficial, not only on the surface, but quite deep. 
Number four, it reports application of appropriate research technique. So the research technique presented in that thesis must be appropriate. Don't be doing something or don't be writing something that is totally irrelevant, totally inappropriate. Number, uh, I don't know what number this is. It shows original contribution to the knowledge within the subject. Yeah, you have to be able, especially for PhDs and master to a certain extent, your contribution to the a new knowledge within that subject must be apparent in your thesis. And it contains experimental results that are suitably reported and correctly discussed and analyzed. And finally, the student shows familiarity with and understanding of the relevant literature. So these are some of the important characteristics for a thesis that is delightful. Um, now, a thesis that is frightful, I don't know whether this is, uh, oh, let me, let me just get rid of this. For a thesis that is frightful, a, a frightful thesis, it generally will put any, anyone reading it into sleep right away. Yeah, you read one sentence, two sentences, and you just cannot open your eyes. You don't feel happy. Unlike this bear, look at this bear. This bear is a happy bear because he is excited. He is um, happy to see that thesis. But a frightful thesis makes the reader quite unhappy, want to run away, feel puzzled, feel confused, very sleepy, very angry, and things like that. So do not produce a thesis that is frightful and that is, uh, and even if, even if after you uh, accepted the invitation to evaluate a thesis and you suddenly found that that thesis is frightful, you cannot refuse it anymore. Remember, once you accept the invitation to examine a thesis, regardless of how you feel about it, about the thesis, you must complete the evaluation as fairly and as timely as possible. Because you might just delay someone's progress or even put someone's life on hold by delaying the evaluation and completion of the thesis report. Because usually when, when people submit their PhD thesis or when people submit their master thesis, if the examiner takes one month, that's acceptable. If examiner takes two months or more than that, that would be a little bit unfair. And long, any longer than that, that would be cruel because that person will not be able to continue with his career progression. So according to this little creature, procrastinate, you shall not. Do not procrastinate. Do not put it, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Oh, I'll do it um, maybe after dinner. Oh, I'll just do it now. Just do it now, yeah? Just do it now because um, the quicker you do it, the 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 quicker it's going to be over and you know over and done with so when you are reading well i am when i'm reading a thesis that i receive the first this is the sequence that i commonly uh, follow when i read that thesis i would first read the title and i would be very very nosy to read the acknowledgement i would want to know who is the supervisor, who are the friends, and uh, who's the family, and things like that. Because I want to put that per that student as a person in front of me. I want to be able to interact with that, with that thesis, and I want to know something about the writer of that thesis. So acknowledgement is something that is important to me. It doesn't take long to read about two minutes. And then after I kind of know who is the writer, who is who is the, the who are the people behind the thesis, the examiner, uh, the supervisors, and so on and so forth. I went. I will go on to read the abstract. Now the abstract uh, will be followed by the objectives and scope or and limitation. So these I I term them the teaser. Yeah, the teaser because this is some some light quick reading that will actually um, make me make my first impression yeah 
first impression of the thesis? Is it, um, is it, I'm going, am, I, am I going to like this? Am I going to feel excited about this or what? Yeah, it's like uh, when you are waiting for a, a big movie to be released, you would see you would see some sneak review or you would be ex excited to see snippets of the movie. Uh, this is like that. I call that the teaser to form my first impression. Then I would go on to after I know the objectives, after I know the scope and limitation of that thesis, I would go on to read the methodology. What are the methods that the student employ uh, to uh, to achieve these objectives here that that had been outlined, and from the methodology, after I understand what the methodology that uh, was being employed. I went on to see, oh, what results did he get? Did he get good results? Did he get um, so-so results? Or did he find something beautiful? And then from the results, I would be very, very curious to read the discussion. Because master's and PhD level, when you get a result, you do not just present the result. You discuss, you analyze, you go into depth about that result. So I would be very, very curious to see how the discussion about certain important findings or certain findings are being carried out. So I would go on to read the discussion. And after I understand the discussion, I would read the conclusion. Now, these four parts, I call it the meat of the thesis, the real thing, the substance. Yeah, this is the meat of the thesis, the methodology, the results, the discussion, the conclusion. If these are not satisfactory, then it's going to be sad story. And then after I'm I'm quite happy reading the con the conclusion, I then go into the introduction because introduction, literature review, format and language, and the rest of it, I call it beautifier. Yeah, to make it beautiful, you may have a very very robust functional house and uh, with good rooms good 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 facilities but if you do not beautify that house it's not going to be a joy is it so you need to have a beautifier in your thesis so the beautifier comes in these chapters the introduction the literature review definitely the format the language it th those are all beautifiers yeah so i'm going to go through the three uh, categories of chapters as um, I have outlined here, the teaser, the meat of the thesis, and the beautifier next. So the structure and connectivity of a thesis, this is something that is extremely important. Sections should be properly linked and interwoven. The title must tie with the abstract. You do not give a title that do not get uh, properly expanded in the abstract. The methods and results will tie with the discussion. If they do not tie, then it's not good. The objectives must tie with the conclusion. Now, this is something that a lot of theses are lacking. The objectives is written in chapter one. The conclusion is commonly written in chapter five. Usually, students, when they write this thesis, they forget to tie the conclusion with the objectives. Now, when they forget to do that deliberately, when they do not do the tying of the conclusion with the objectives in a deliberate manner, then that is not going to be making a very, very tight thesis, yeah? Figures and tables must complement each other. Yeah, they must complement the, co the discussion, they must complement each other, and references must be written correctly and coherently. Uh, okay, uh, Puan, Puan Salina, boleh mute kan tak? Puan, Puan Salina, can you mute? Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, these are the structure and connectivity of a thesis that usually an examiner will be looking at. They must, they want to know if the student actually, when when he write or she writes the thesis, he, she actually uh, has a good framework of um, 
the whole uh, thesis. The teaser, which I said, the title, abstract objective scope, the meat, the beautifier. Now, about the teaser, are you tickled by the teaser? Do you feel excited by the teaser? Yeah, it must be the teaser, your title, your abstract, objective, scope, and limitation must be informative, must be on point, must be attractive and effective. It must give an accurate glimpse of the thesis content. The content of the thesis must be presented in summary in the teaser. Now, after going through a good teaser, an evaluator would be feeling like this. He would have a pretty good idea what story is presented in the thesis. The examiner would be able to imagine what would be dished out in the chapters of methodology, results, and discussion. Because if the examiner is also in that field, when he reads the title, abstracts, objectives, and scope and limitation, he would be able to imagine, ah, uh, they will employ this methodology. They will have this kind of result. Or they will be discussing it like this. Yeah, He would be able to have a, uh, uh, um, an idea of what is going to be the next that he will meet in the thesis. He would be able to speculate the main points of the conclusion. And he would be excited to read and enjoy the whole thesis. So if the teaser is an effective teaser, then this is what the examiner would feel. So students writing must be having all this in mind. Am I going to be able to give this kind of feeling to anyone reading this thesis? Yeah. So next, uh, I'm going to talk about the meat of the thesis, which is the methodology, the results, discussion, and the conclusion. The meat of the thesis must be correct, must be robust, airtight, substantial. They must support and strengthen each other. It gives the whole and complete story of the research. Yeah. So this is the, the very, very uh, important uh, uh, part of your thesis. Yeah. When going through this part, the evaluator should assess that the, metho the methodologies employed are suitable to achieve the objectives, that the results are substantial, that the results are presented logically and systematically, the data sets are discussed well, correctly, thoroughly, coherently, and that the candidate is well-versed with the underlying theories and display mastery and confidence when discussing the results. And the novelty of the finding will have to be apparent when reading this meat of the thesis. And there must be a contribution to new knowledge. The bottom line is the examiner will ask himself or herself, am I convinced? Am I convinced? So to convince the examiners or to convince the readers, students would have to be able to produce something like this. Yeah, not earth shaking. Definitely, you don't have to be doing something that is a uh, rocket uh, of uh, the science of the moon or something, but it has to be well presented, correctly presented. You must display your mastery and your confidence in that subject. Yeah, so that is the meat of the. This is, is the meat substantial? Is it satisfying? So that is the question for the biggest and strongest part of your thesis. And I'm going to go next into the beautifier. The beautifier, does it take your breath away? When you see something beautiful, you gasp. <gasps> beautiful, yep. So does that does the beautifier make you do that? Does it take your breath away? The introduction, the literature review, the format and languages, references, supplementary data. Evaluate that uh, the examiner will have to evaluate that each section of the thesis fulfills its purpose clearly and concisely. The examiner will be looking for these things. In the introduction, the examiner will have to see uh, the introduction that reveals the candidate's mastery 
of all the relevant overarching principles, yeah, whatever principle, fundamental uh, knowledge that you have to know about uh, that subject must be displayed in the introduction. Literature review should display the breadth, the depth, and the currentness of the candidate's knowledge on, on and around the subject, and it should lead and link nicely into the meat part. The literature review would have to prepare the examiner into reading the methodology. If you're talking about something beautiful, but it's something totally not related to what you are reporting in the chapter of methodology and, and results in discussion, then let literature review is irrelevant. Yeah, you must uh, write something that is relevant to the subject or to the things that you are going to be reporting. Format and language. So candidates should put a lot of care and effort the spelling, the sentence structure, and, and the, the format, just follow the format. You have to keep the evaluator sweet. I have gone through some, some theses that are quite strong. Uh, the meat is good, but the language is, my goodness, the English, I end up, I end up doing a lot of my, uh, giving a lot of my time in correcting the English of that thesis. So that, keeps me that makes me mad it 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 doesn't it doesn't make me sweet on the on the candidate so that is dangerous the references what gets mentioned in the text must tell you 100% with what is in the list at the back so if you mention ahmad et al in your in your text you must have ahmad et al at the back in the reference because the exam examiner would want to refer to that um would want to refer to the references that you mentioned and supplementary data it is a definite plus if relevant data is arranged sensibly and systematically in my field if you are putting infrared in appendix a you are putting infrared uh, according to maybe the series of compounds that you are discussing accordingly in sequence. So the examiner can go through it in a good system. There must be a system that you put when you are putting your um, uh, appendices, for example. So the beautifier must be able to do all this. So be very, very careful. Uh, when you, if you are a student when you are writing all this yeah now after you have written uh after you have read the thesis that you are given the responsibility to evaluate you must report the evaluation what i always find what i always do is i have a, a little notebook that I keep together with the thesis that I that I am evaluating, and I, in my notebook I will I will note on what page, what figure, or what in what which line, and I will write using my uh, handwriting my concern about that or my comment that I want. And after I finish the whole thesis, I would have probably, I don't know, a few pages uh, full in my notebook, and I'm going to sort out my uh, little notes, handwritten notes, in a formal written report. Yeah, I would check the uh, forms provided by universities, graduate school, usually each university will have its own format. Generally, they will have similar things, but they would have their own format. So you follow that university's format. Do not use a different format because it will actually make uh, some kind of confusion uh, later on. You have to give clear and specific comments that could assist the candidate to make improvements and correction. Now, this is what is important. You must comment with the frame of mind to improve, not comment to condemn. Yeah, Evaluated, Evaluators must all, may also write comments on the thesis itself, drawing attention to them in the written formal report. If you are making scribbles on a diagram, for example, put in your report, please refer to page so-and-so in the thesis on the figure 20. Then people will refer, the student will refer to what you have written in there. 
And in addition, evaluators may attach a list of comments highlighting the relevant page numbers in the thesis. So this is an example of things that are requested by the university to evaluate the appropriateness of the thesis title, research problem and hypothesis, literature review, objectives, and so on and so forth. In the end, uh, they would want you to give a comment on the overall accomplishment, the merits of the thesis, and the demerits of the thesis. This is, this is very, very common. It may not come in this form, but the content is always like this, something similar. And this is an example of a thesis report that I have uh, written in year 2012. Um, I, uh, I did, in, in my report, I made sure on the header, I put who the student name is, what university, what date, um, who is, who's, ex, whose report is this, yeah? So, for example, when commenting on the appropriateness of the thesis title, um, I write something like this. I said, the title of the thesis is acceptable. However, the use of the word novel in the title may be somewhat arguable since the framework of the complexes presented in the thesis may not necessarily be newly discovered. I would like to suggest the use of the word new instead, instead of novel use the word new. So you see, I'm not saying that what I'm doing is absolutely correct and everybody must follow this, but the general notes here that I would like to remind examiners is that you must mind your language. You must comment politely. Remember, this person has spent three, four, five years of his life to produce this thesis. You must respect that. Don't be harsh. If you want, if you want to uh, make a point, make a point uh, in a polite way. That will actually be desirable. In Malay, we have a saying, it says, ular menyusur di akar, takkan hilang bisanya. Yeah? A snake that slithers on lowly tree roots will not lose its venom. You don't have to be nasty to make an impact. You can be nice and make a very, very big impact. Yeah, And it is good practice to furnish your report with relevant information like what I did at the top here. So that is one example of a, a beginning of a thesis report. Uh, for the literature, uh, this is something that I uh, that I wrote. I'm, I usually don't list down each and every single mistake. I just make a, a comment and I say, please see the notes I wrote on the thesis. I found the papers uh, lean heavily on older publications. So I want the student to go onto newer papers, methodology, um, things like that. You, you make, you make uh, comments and you make suggestions uh, for, for examining, to, to assist, to assist the student to uh, improve that this is hopefully after the viva, it will be just a minor correction. The overall accomplishment, you just do, um, uh, the volume, this is what I commented on that student in Unimas, the volume of work presented is very satisfactory and there are many new compounds successfully characterized up to the X-ray single crystal. Well, he presented up to 12, I think, single crystal. Um, uh, analysis interpretation, after going through what he did, I, I commented, I make a, a summary. Uh, 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 however, I found that lumping together important spectral da data for compound does not help in comparison. There are no proper tabulation of selected, selected important data. So you make your own suggestion how that thesis can be improved. But you have to be open. You, you, do, not, you do not stick to your own framework uh, and say you do it like this or otherwise you fail. No, that's not the way we go in. We go in with the fra uh, frame of mind to make it better. Yeah, and be open. Be open to, uh, you celebrate differences. Celebrate differences as long as it presents the, the strength of the thesis. Um, uh, 
I have uh, some general comments that when I went through this, I have gone through the thesis and penciled in the corrections needed to be done on the pages and some accompanied. This was, I, I like using pink stickers, markers, um, whatever, whatever that, you know, can be easily noticeable. Uh, I, I make, I make things like this so that uh, the student can actually see what is it that's bothering me. Points to remember, first of all, give due credit. If you see that he has done a good job, you just say, yeah, it's a good job. However, there is something that needs to be improved. You come in with the aim to be constructive. The point of evaluation is certainly not to terrorize or belittle the candidate. Be specific in your comments so candidate can address the weakness well. Only remember, only recorded comments and suggestions will be addressed. If you say something that you do not write, it's not going to get done. Yeah. So if it bothers you, write it down to be improved. Otherwise, you must hold your peace. Yeah. Uh, notes for, for example, what are the merits of the thesis? What are the merits of the thesis? The date of the Viva Vose for the student that I was evaluating was exactly on the last day of the third year of his PhD candidacy. So he actually submitted not uh, maybe about uh, two and a half years after he 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 begin began his PhD. So he had presented a substantial amount of work in his thesis, but the presentation was a bit weak. There was a lot of grammatical error. There was a lot of um, uh, uh, in Malay, we say chalaru, eh? uh, it's, it's very lumped together, you don't see flow, but do not penalize the candidate for the weakness in the beautifier and the teaser if the meat is satisfactory. If the work is satisfactory, there is strength in the work, there is good findings, do not unnecessarily penalize the student because the beauty fire is not good enough, the teaser is not exciting enough. You just ask because the internal examiner for this uh, particular student, the internal examiner from the same university gave fail to the student. And I said, why do you fail him? His work is substantial. It's only his presentation in the thesis that's not properly done. So we get him to make the presentation better. Do not fail him. So, um, yes, luckily the, the, the chairman listened to me during the Viva and the student uh, did not fail the, the, the PhD, but he did have to do a lot of um, repair work in his thesis, yeah? So, the point that I want to tell young examiners are uh, do not get too carried away. Do not unnecessarily fail a student. Remember, you do not penalize the candidate for the weakness is in, in, in chapters that are not the meat. If the meat is good, no matter how ugly is the beautifier, no matter how boring is the teaser, don't fail him, just get him to address that thing. Yeah? Okay, that is the important point. So after you finish evaluating your student, after you wrote the, the report, come the Viva Vose. The Viva Vose can be good, can be bad, and can be very ugly. So welcome to part two of my talk. I hope I'm not taking too much time. For part two of this talk, I would like to uh, do some sharing so that um, everyone would be able to distinguish the roles of examiners, the internal and external, the role of a chairperson in a viva, the role of supervisor in a viva, and and you would be able to, after you, hopefully after you listen to what I'm, I have to say today, you would be able to carry out the role of an examiner, either internal or external, effectively during a Viva Vose session. So let's see. Viva Vose, what is it and why? Yeah, what is a Viva? We always say, what is a Viva and why? Why do we have to have a Viva? Now, a Viva Vose is a Latin phrase, literally, literally meaning life for voice yeah 
listen. Yeah, it's it's a live presentation. In the academic context, it is an oral examination, especially in a defense of a thesis. A viva can be a chance to save the candidate who has produced a weak thesis, kind of weak. It is it can be a helpful and a nurturing process for everyone involved not only for the student, even for the examiner, even for the supervisor, yeah? It, the supervisor, I as a supervisor who, who have sat through many of my students, uh, Viva Bose sessions, I forever continuously learning from all of the sessions. It, I found the Viva sessions very helpful, very nurturing. It is an opportunity for a healthy academic discourse and networking. Why is a Viva Bose important? It is important to explore how the candidates' research make a contribution to the knowledge. This is, we want to establish this. We want to examine that the, the candidates' ability to defend and clarify the thesis, helping to ensure that the work is the candidates' own work, because usually, hopefully, it doesn't happen. Uh, usually, sometimes we hear we hear um, people uh, saying, "Oh, that's not his work. Actually, he's just presenting somebody else's work or something like that." The viva voce is to ensure that what is presented is the person's own work, and ultimately to ensure that the student is worthy of a doctorate and a master's degree or a master's degree. He is worthy of being called a doctor. Yeah. As a rough estimate, this is my own estimate, about 80% of candidates pass with minor correction. So don't worry, those who are going to go through your VIVA, don't worry. If you put in all the effort, 80% you're going to pass with minor correction. Some 10% have to make major correction. 5%, very small amount, fail outright. I have one. Uh, case where he the, the 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 candidate had to rewrite and represent one case because that was totally cannot be helped and five percent will be with no alteration. Very lucky these people had uh, no alteration. I I had to do one alteration after my viva, which was a spelling mistake in the acknowledgement section. So very lucky in, in a way that my viva went very well, one, and, one hour and 15 minutes and with one minor, very minor spelling mistake correction in the acknowledgement. So um, who is who in a viva session? Now chairperson, you have a chairperson, you have internal examiner, you have external examiner and you have coordinator and of course you have the student. Notice that a supervisor's presence is not uh, compulsory. Yeah, these people are compulsory. Now, a chairperson is usually an academic member of staff of the home faculty of or the home university. It is typically a person of academic standing, usually a professor, but not expected to have read the full thesis. The chairperson is not expected to have read the full thesis but he must have he must have actually gone through uh, the summary of the reports given by the internal and external he need not to be trained in the same field but he must have a wide experience in the area that's the chairperson who is the internal examiner uh, internal examiner is an appointed academic from the home faculty or the home university he has read the thesis and has submitted a written report. An external examiner is a, an appointed academic from a different university. He has read and submitted a written re report. Usually we have a coordinator from the Office of Graduate uh, School or the faculty, and we have the student. Remember the student, even if the student has somehow a knowledge who is going, who is his external, who is his internal. There should not be any contact between the candidate and the examiners after the examiner's appointment until the date of the viva voce. They can, cannot have any kind of contact. 
because that would be uh, unethical. Now, the role of a chairperson. Now, if you are appointed to be a chairperson, it is actually an honor. I always enjoy being a chairperson if I'm given the opportunity. You, you are expected to introduce everyone, putting everybody at ease. Yeah, that is the role of a chairperson, just to make sure everybody is feeling good at the beginning of the, of the session, outline the structure and format of the session, ensure fair speaking opportunities for all. Don't let just one person take the mic. Everybody must speak. Keep control of the discussion and observe reasonable time. Chair the post viva versus discussion with the examin examiners, assisting examiners in formulation of a recommendation. The chairperson do not give a recommendation, but he is expected to assist examiners to come up with a um, agreed recommendation with a pass or fail or whatever. The chairperson must ensure that examiners complete and sign the relevant forms at the end of the viva voce. That is clerical, really. But just make sure all the documents are signed, all the uh, everything is handed in. The chair is not expected to actively join in the questioning session. Yeah, the chair is just observing and making sure everything is in order. Chair can only intervene if. There appears to be bias, misconduct, bullying, or unfairness. Chair can intervene if the examiners are diverting from the agreed format of the viva voce in such a manner that will disadvantage the candidate and the session is progressing in a way that could compromise the university's academic standard. So that is the chair. It can intervene when such situation occurs. Actions which a chair might take will include call a temporary halt to the meeting if things are getting out of control, just stop the meeting for a while. He can hold a private discussion with the examiners, private discussion with the candidate if things are getting very, very distraught and he needs to, you know, put things in order. He needs to have a private discussion that he can do so and he can end the examination if things really, really can't be safe and that is very very exceptional it doesn't happen very often now the role of examiners before the viva examiners have very very important role they have to go through through uh, before the viva go through the thesis entirely submit independent report on the thesis during the viva the examiners will ask questions to the candidates assist in determining and verifying whether the results, arguments, and information presented in the thesis and as defended in the viva voce examination meet the academic standard re relevant to the degree pursued and make sure that they are truly the outcome of the candidate's own work and to make recommendation for improvement of the thesis. That is during the viva. And after the viva, before giving the results, the examiners are expected to convene in the presence of the chairperson in deciding what award should be given to the person, to the candidate, what corrections need to be done and to determine how long is the correction period and to determine who checks the correction, the corrected thesis. Uh, if applicable, usually um, people will agree that it is the internal examiner's duty to check the corrected thesis. And Finally, to produce a joint report on the viva voce examination and a joint recommendation. So that is the role of the examiner. Next, I'm going to say I'm going to go briefly on the role of the supervisor during the viva voce. Now, supervisor may or may not attend the viva voce examination, but usually I make a point to attend all my students viva voce. But I can be excluded. Examiners may request that the supervisor is or are not present. So if the examiners feel they're not comfortable to have the supervisor that they're within their rights to say, no, can you please sit this one out? Um, yeah. If the examiner is present, a supervisor acts only as an observer and may make a comment only with permission or upon invitation 
from the examiners and the chairperson. So be quiet, observe, and talk only when spoken to. Speak only when spoken to. Yeah. If the examiner is not present in the Viva Voce, it is recommended that the supervisor is available and contactable at the time of the Viva Voce. You know, sit next to your phone, uh, be on the next door, or if you are not in town, uh, make sure you are internet ready, yeah? In case the examiners feel that his or her presence in the Viva is required, for example, maybe to give support to the student. Remember, you have done all that you can as a supervisor. It is time to let go because it is time for your student to defend himself or herself or and his work. So you just um, let it go, say frozen, let it go, yeah? Sorry about that. Okay, when we have uh, disagreements and disputes, about the uh, candidates. This agreement between examiners should be resolved by the examiners on the basis of detailed discussion on specific academic points arising from the examination and a joint discussion should be, and a joint decision should be reached. You must resolve any disagreement face to face. Any disagreement between external and internal examiner, you will have particular weight given on the view of the external. So external is more, uh, has more right. It, if there is any disagreement or dispute, usually the view of the external examiner is much more weightier than the view of the internal examiner. Where there are two external examiners, particular way it should be given to the chairperson. Now, this is where the chairperson steps in when there is the disagreement and dispute. In the case where examiners recommend that a PhD degree is not awarded and that the candidate not permitted to submit for re-examination, this is a very, very sad case, the examiners may subsequently consider whether or not the work is sufficient for the award of a master level degree. We can do that. And if they agree that a master's level award would be merited for a PhD candidate, then a separate recommendation may be made in writing to the effect. Hopefully this will never happen to anyone we know. Now, Viva Bose, the good Viva Bose. What is a, the criteria of a good Viva Bose? First of all, it does not take too long unnecessarily. It doesn't have to take three, four, five hours. A good Viva Bose, I don't know, mine was one hour and 15 minutes and that was long enough for me, I thought. So your, the Viva Bose, this is where the chairman will, will have to play a big role. Do not allow it to, to become too long unless everybody is having such a good time discussing the result and uh, everybody's happy and jolly in there talking, they can talk many, many hours about it. But don't let it take too long. A good Viva Voce is well managed and mediated by the chairperson. A good Viva Voce challenges the candidate enough to test his knowledge and mastery of his thesis but do not, it does not make him feel bullied. Never bully your candidate. That is not good. And a good Viva Voce is a gratifying scholarly discussion for everybody present. Now, at the end of a good Viva Voce session, the examiners will feel satisfied and convinced. The candidate will feel that he has a clear idea how to do the thesis corrections and eager to get going on it and the supervisors will feel accomplished. So, so that is an indicator of a good Viva Voce. What about the bad and the ugly Viva Voce? There are many possible reasons why a Viva Voce can turn bad and ugly. It can be caused by any of the people in that session. The candidate may not be well prepared. That will make a very bad Viva Voce. 
the candidate <laughs> submits different versions of his thesis. Now, this has happened. When, when the candidate uh, submitted a thesis for evaluation, he submitted a version A, for example. And he had two months, three months to wait before the viva. So he made improvement to his thesis between the submission and the viva. And he brought in his new thesis, new improved thesis. So that's a bad, that's going to make a very bad viva, I will say, because the examiners will feel violated. They spend so much of their time, so much energy and effort on a version of the thesis, and the presentation is on a different version of the thesis. Never ever do this. Yeah. Okay. So that's going to make a good, a bad viva uh, session. Now, examiners may also cause a bad and ugly viva session. The examiner has not read the thesis properly. That's going to be bad. The examiner goes on an ego trip. He keep on saying, oh, I think this is this I, 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 I. When somebody talks too much in the word I, me, I, me, that's not an ego, big, big ego person. That's, that shouldn't happen in a, in a viva. In a viva, it is about the candidate. It's not about the examiner. Remember that. It is about the candidate. It's never about the examiner. Examiners are there to assist, make it better. Some examiners will be off the wall, quirky, maverick. They don't play by the rules. So that can make things go very bad in the examination. I have, I have gone through something similar to this. Now, the chairperson. The chairperson can be also the cause of the bad and ugly the chairperson fails to control the session that's going to be bad and the chairperson becomes the third or the first exa examiner i mean the the examiners will be asking questions to the student and the chairperson comes in and asks more and more and more that's not fair that's not going to be acceptable chairperson ought not ask questions um beyond an acceptable level. If I was being a chairperson, I would refrain from asking. I probably would nudge and hint, but I would refrain from asking. And the supervisor, if the supervisor is present, he can also make the session very bad. When the supervisor does not prepare the student well, this is what I and my students before the viva or before any session presentation, even, even um, for conference, I would go through every single slide with my students just to make sure that he knows what he writes about and he is uh, on top of everything. And it was, it is going to be bad also if the supervisor answers most of the question. The examiner asks the student, the supervisor answer. Uh, ask the student, supervisor answer. That's bad. That's bad. Don't do that. Okay. Viva will say the ugly. This is a few scenario depicted after an ugly or after a few ugly Viva will say session. One candidate who in fact passed with minor correction reported when he left the Viva, he felt as if, well, it's a she, she felt as if she had been hit on the head and she burst into tears with the sense that her years of research had been a waste of time now this is a bad one yeah we do not want a student to feel like this i have had a viva session when my student also passed with a minor correction but it was a three-hour session and it was a nightmare so that was a bad one a nightmare because of the examiner now this is a comment by an examiner. As an examiner, I was involved with one viva where we had to fail the student. The viva was to see if we could get something out of it, but we could not. It still sends a shiver down my spine when I talk about it. So examiners are very much affected by this. They try to help, but if they cannot help and has to fail the student, that is actually a big failure. Uh, we, 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 
we as examiners feel the feel the sadness as well but nothing can be nothing can be done if 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 it's too bad we just have to do it yes so this is my final slide as a parting word a phd thesis would not win you a nobel prize remember this students yeah your phd thesis will not win you a nobel prize a no this is a novel. This is not a novel. It should be a novel. It is just a training ground to make you a credible researcher. Your PhD is a training ground. So don't feel too pressured. Yeah. And it takes a village to raise a child. We know this, but it takes a whole university to produce a PhD graduate. And my own uh, feeling is it is always better to judge leniently than to judge unfairly. So those are my parting words. I thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Are we here? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Prof. Hada, for your inspiring and I think very valuable uh, presentation for us. Okay. Uh, and now I would like to open the floor for question and session answer sessions. Okay. Okay. I already have a few questions. I think about nine questions. Oh, okay. too many. Nine <laughs> questions here. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> it's, I think I will ask only five questions here. Okay. This one comes from Niza Zafa uh, from Pakistan. He's a PhD candidate. The question is, the question is, uh, can you give some advice on the length of introduction and literature review? Ah, yeah. okay. Why is the many 50 pages or 40 pages or something? It just gives it. Okay. Uh, there is no hard and fast rule on this one, but uh, even the length of a thesis, there is no hard and fast rule about that. I've seen very thin thesis. I've seen very thick thesis. I've seen two volume thesis. Yeah. But I would say a safe bet would be your introduction may, if, if, if your thesis is about 200 pages, that is a, an average. Do you agree, Dr. Fauzi? 200 yeah. pages for a uh, PhD thesis? PhD, yeah, sufficient. Yeah. Sufficient. I would, say, yeah. I would say 10% would be introduction. So that would be about 20 pages. And yes. I would say about 30% would be for your literature review maximum. Don't go beyond yeah. that. Yeah, I, maybe about 50, 50 pages, 60 pages. It, even 60 is quite a lot. It's quite okay. sufficient. So about that. Yeah, yeah I think I agree with, the, with you. I think I think we go to the next question because we had uh, this one. Okay, thank you for the answer, I think. Uh, Niza, uh, Niza, you can get uh, the answer. Thank you. Prof. Hada. Second question, I give this one. Next is from Kairia Murat. It is possible for us to contact you with the examiner after the VIVA. VIVA, after the VIVA exam. Oh, yes. Uh, is it possible for candidate to contact examiners yes. after the VIVA session? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay Kairia. Possible. Uh, possible. Yeah, Kairia, you get the answer yes. already. Next question yes. from Rose Diana Sukardi. Yeah. Now, oh, this is a friend from Sabah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, Waiwa Wasi, Waiwa Wasi is done online. How can it be effective in helping the candidates and also from the examiner perspective? Perspective. Oh. How did this online? I, I have. I have gone through one or two online uh, by Wawose and I truly enjoyed it. There's no problem, uh, PM Ross, because uh, we have we have rules that the students have to follow. The student has to be alone in the room by himself. So we depend on the integrity of the student to abide by. He, he will not need to have a room full of his mom and dad and grandma and children and everything in the room. No, no, that's not allowed. He has to be alone in the room by himself. Yes, if possible, uh, we request that the candidate, uh, I have also seen a candidate who arranged with the library to provide him with a, with a, with a, a 
suitable venue to to present and then um it's it's totally enjoyable pm rose um uh viva will say online it's it's i, I don't see any problem in it okay. everybody is doing what they should be doing well okay. bless thank us, you really. okay uh next question yes. okay this one uh there are many questions then i think it's about uh, i try to answer we i hope you can answer as many as possible i try okay this one is very interesting from aina i'm uh, aina from postgraduate student from dental faculty i think you are here okay and then she would like to know may i know which reference style is suitable for thesis write-up for thesis well, I think in UITM, we always use the APA style, the American F F F Psychological uh, Association style, the APA style. I, if you go to IPSIS uh, website, okay. you, will, you will see a few guidelines there on uh, what kind of reference style that uh, you can use. So we use APA, APA style. Okay, I think uh, I think that would be the the, the most suitable. Also, thank you, thank you. I think uh, Aina, I think you get it. The answer from Prof Ada. Okay, now another one. Nor one nor Africa. As young academics, how can we promote ourselves to be chosen or nominated as an internal or external examiner? Okay, this is. Uh... This is a very, very relevant question. You are eager to experience your yes. first um, uh, your first evaluation, internal or external. Now, to promote yourself, first of all, you must uh, show credibility. You must um, show that you are able uh, and you are competent within that field. And this is where network networking is very, very important. Okay. Make friends, find people. I mean, there are there are I mean, if you are if you are uh, grade 52, usually you do not get to be appointed as external examiner yet. Okay. Grade 52. Am I right? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, is that thing, uh, yes, yeah. if you right. are grade 54 associate professor, you can be appointed as external examiner for master students. Okay. Having having had uh, okay. a, a, a doctorate yourself. Yeah? Yes. Okay, and, yes. And if you have uh, been appointed full professor, then you can be appointed as a PhD external examiner. Yeah, that okay. that depends on universities, but that is the common guide. Yeah. So what actually happens is like this. We have internal and external examiners. Usually the way that a faculty would strategize to promote the young ones yeah. is to uh, appoint a senior external examiner, a full professor, somebody who is big in the field, and then they would appoint a, an internal examiner from the young uh, lecturers that they have at the faculty. So faculty can play a big role. Okay. Hi, Sheha, I see you there. Okay. Faculties can play a big role um, in promoting okay. and of course networking. Yeah, you, 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 if you want to be seen, you have to shine. Okay. Yeah? okay. Thank you. you want to be seen, you have to shine. Okay, this one, Prof. Another question from again from Kairia Murad. If yes, someone, sir. if someone unfortunately get the major correction, mm -hmm. it is possible for them to get to get GOT graduate on time. I think graduate on time. Oh. Uh, it is possible for them to GOT graduate on time. It all depends on the student. The it students, all depends yeah? on okay. the student. Okay. Yeah. If you if you can say you submit within the minimum candidature, two years. Okay. Yeah. Minimum candidature, if I'm not mistaken, for PhD is two years. You okay. submit. Okay. After you submit, uh, the examiners feel that your thesis yes. is not yet sufficient or your knowledge is not yes. yet um mature. Okay. So they give you a major. 
Nah, lah kita tak nak lah kan. Hopefully minor they, correction. Uh, they give you a major. If you are still within that three years or three and a half years, uh, uh, GOT is four years, is it? Four, four, 48 four. months, I think. Three and a half years. Eh? Yeah, I am not sure. Look, look into yeah. your, look into your um, uh, academic regulation for Regulations. your post uh, uh, postgraduate school, and okay. and uh, yes. The answer is yes, you can still GOT. GOT depends on time. When do you get your degree? If you get your degree within that specific time, then you can get GOT. I think your question is, will he, okay. be, even if he finished on time, okay. will he be penalized? Okay. I, I don't know. I don't think so. I, I'm, I've never experienced this. I'm sorry, I can't give okay. you a good answer. Okay, this one, I think I got from Dr. Muzami. Uh, Mohamad, as, hey, as an examiner, may I know how do we control or buffer the things that we know, our expertise, yeah, we know, to the presented data by candidates during the VIVA. So, VIVA, so it won't undermine other people's work, works. I believe this is quite important, especially if they have wrongly analyzed the raw data. Do you get the question, Prof? Yes, I do get the question. Okay. When the examiner detected a wrong uh, uh, method of analysis or wrong methodology or whatever, mm -hmm. how do you point that out without hurting other people, without undermining other people? Because uh, the student will have been advised by supervisor over the past few years. Yeah, that is a question. <laughs> you just have to say it politely, Muzamil. Okay. <laughs> you okay. just have to say it politely and refer to the relevant references. It's always safe to bring your own references and say, I, you know, it is interesting. I find this in this reference, and they analyze it differently. Why don't you try this analysis? All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, quickly. Okay. I think it's, uh, uh, those. Uh, I will. Uh, we have your some question. Yeah, many questions. I think two or three questions here. I think we are. Uh, I can. Uh, send the question to Prof Hada, and then Prof Hada will. Uh, send send back by WhatsApp through WhatsApp through you. Yeah, the, um, I know the people. Uh, yeah, I, I know think, the people. Yeah, I think uh, you, uh, Prof. Hada, you can contact them. Okay. Now I think already um, quarter past uh, one. Okay. I think we can stop our uh, presentation, our session. Thank you very much, Prof. Hada, uh, actually uh, appointing me <laughs> as the moderator for your <laughs> for your presentation. Well, thank, thank you very you. much, Prof. Hada. Nice. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fauzi. Thank you, Sharil. Thank you, Faculty of Applied Sciences. And thank you for everyone. I think at the peak, I, I got almost 350. Uh, what was the maximum number of participation just now? Almost 350? I don't know. Yeah, so I thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Those who come from uh, within UITM, those who come from uh, our uh, different universities in Malaysia, different universities in Pakistan, in Indonesia. Thank you very much for coming, and I'm very humbled by your presence. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Friends and friends, you, we can continue later. Hi, Nurul. <laughs> okay, bye, everyone. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Bye. Okay, keep Thank safe. You. Bye. Hi, bye, Rosana. Rosana is the vice chancellor of the uh, Women University in Pakistan. Hi, Rosana. Ah, Rosana. Professor Rosana. She <laughs> were together doing our PhD in Guildford uh, all those years ago, and now Rosana is the vice chancellor in one oh. of the universities in Pakistan. Thank you for gracing us with your presence, Rosana. Love you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Assalamualaikum.